Today's message has been brought to you by Faith Family Church in Billings, Montana. For more information, visit faithfamilybillings.com. Well, this morning I'm actually going to wrap up the message, (laughs) the series on Rooted. We're in a series and we've entitled it Rooted Depth of Character. And uh, if you want to go to 2 Peter chapter 1, we're going to go there and wrap this up today. 2 Peter chapter 1. How many think Peter had to develop in some fruit of the Spirit? You know, sometimes people think, well, how could that person be called the minister? Look at their temper. Look at Peter. <laughs> don't, don't back Peter into a corner and give him a sword. That's all I've got to say there. I mean, that doesn't give you the right to stay that way, but God uses us where we're at. Brother Hagin used to say to us, he'd say, if, you, if you're going to wait, if God was going to wait for all of us to be absolutely mature to use us, he'd never use anybody. And he's right. Okay, but what God can do and he will do, he'll restrict influence until character can be established for levels of influence. Amen. So anyway, second Peter chapter one, and we're going to look at this and we're going to wrap up some characteristics here. But I want to read in verse two, uh, second Peter one, verse two, it says grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to by glory and virtue. Verse 4. By which have been given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these we may be, you may be partakers of the divine nature. Notice that we partake of the divine nature through the promises. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Verse 5, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith. And this is where we've been talking about this particular thing. We are adding to our faith specific things. And look what Peter by the Holy Spirit tells us to add to our faith. He says, add to your faith virtue. And we, we talked about what virtue was. And then he said, add to your virtue knowledge. And we talked about what knowledge is. And then we talked about to knowledge, self-control. How many think that might be a good thing to add on to knowledge? Okay. To self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. To brotherly kindness, love. Now watch what he says in verse 8. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of of our Lord Jesus Christ. How, would, how many would like to be neither barren nor unfruitful? I don't want to be either one of those things in my spiritual walk at all. I want to be, so if we, so through, by the Holy Spirit, the, through the Apostle Peter, the, the Lord is telling us, look, if you add these characteristics to your faith, you're going to be a productive believer. You will produce offspring. You will produce fruit. You will be something or someone that is an advancer of the kingdom, not a hinderer of the kingdom. Amen? So uh, he says in verse 9, For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. So it's possible as a believer to uh, get short-sighted, get blind to what you've been redeemed from. Verse 10, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. Wow. That's a big promise right there. If you do what? If you add to your faith these characteristics and you function and operate in these characteristics, these byproducts of the resurrection seed that lives on the inside of you, you will never stumble. How many of you would like to never stumble? Oh, praise God. We've got a promise here. We've got some, some uh, striving after here, f- some functioning out of the resurrection within us that we see. Verse 11, For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I want to review a couple of things here. Um, 
why it's necessary to have fruit. We talked about pruning before in John 15. I'm not going to go back to that, but you can go back and listen online if you'd like to listen to the messages. But pruning fruit trees is a necessary chore that improves sunlight penetration and increases air movement through the tree. Pruning also develops the structure of the tree so that it can support the crop load. Damaged limbs are susceptible to disease and insect infestation that could further damage the tree. Pruning of trees should be done with a purpose in mind. The purpose for prunings, pruning are the purposes for pruning are varied. Some pruning is done to change or train a plant's growing pattern or to restrict growth. Now, if you read through the verses that we just read through and kind of review in your mind and, and, and think about what uh, the Apostle Peter was saying, if you look at it and think about it, there are people that don't add to their faith the things that they should, and their growth pattern of their Christian life takes a turn. They get off into things that are not uh, uh, spiritual. They're not birthed out of love or the fruit of the Spirit. And a Christian, how many know that a Christian can look just like the world? Did you know that? That doesn't, uh, you, your salvation is, is a hard thing to lose. I'm not telling you you can't because we know from Hebrews 6 that you can Okay, not lose it like, oh, where did it go? You'd have to deny it, okay? It's not like you walking down the street one day, I'm a Christian, slipped on a banana peel, and bam, I'm not a Christian anymore. That's not how it works. This is an intentional thing, okay? So that's good to understand, okay? So, but you can, as a believer, you can begin to, instead of pruning the fleshly nature off of you, you can begin to feed the fleshly nature and actually suffocate the spiritual nature or the fruit of the Spirit from Christ's seed within you from operating the way it should. And when you do that, what happens is you stunt the growth of one and increase the growth of the other. See, Paul made this statement to the Galatians. He said, by the Spirit of Christ within you, yield or put to death the deeds of the body, and live out of the Spirit. Amen? How many know this, that you're constantly in contradiction kind of with yourself? If you read Galatians chapter 5, you'll see this because Paul said that the Spirit sets itself against the flesh and the flesh sets itself against the Spirit. Why? These are in opposition of each other that you may not do the things that you please. In other words, that your flesh may be trained to shut up and sit down and your spirit may be allowed to stand up and speak out. Does that make sense? So that's what we're talking about. That's, the, that's, that's what es essentially what for in 1 Peter 2 here, what Peter is talking about. He's saying, look, we've got to direct the growth pattern of believers' lives. You know, sometimes people think, well, I got saved. Isn't that enough? No, it's not. It means you'll make heaven, but if you don't understand what you've received, the devil will eat your lunch. He'll eat your lunch and steal next week's lunch money while he's at it. You say, what? how is that possible? Because ignorance, you can be ignorant in unbelief. You can have unbelief because of ignorance. And the, the victory that overcomes the world in our lives is what? Faith. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So if you're ignorant in an area, the devil can deceive you when you have light available right here. So once you're born again, that's why, like even in evangelism, if you're going to share your faith, and you should share your faith, you should do everything you can to get the harvest in the bin. Why? So that they don't get their... They, they, I know people, that they are born again, but their lives are a wreck because they won't function in, out of the resurrection within them. For, sometimes it's because of ignorance. Sometimes it's just because they, they just are not going to do it. You know what I mean? They're just not going to do it. They're rebellious. So we need to watch out for that. So why does God prune our lives? Why does God uh, desire these fruits to grow and increase in our lives? Why does he make the changes in our lives being led by the Spirit of God and the Word of God that he does? Because he wants to increase our ability to be able to handle more spiritual fruit. He wants to direct the growth pattern of our lives. How many, uh, and we've talked about this before, but the, the correlations, see the two, the two uh, descriptions of pruning that I gave you are off Google. You know, Google's spiritual. <laughs> In other words, how many have met a Christian 
who has not been pruned and they're, they're, in, they're infected with insects and they have, they have infection, they have disease in the plant because they have not allowed the Lord to prune their life. Amen. Do you know God will tell you not to do certain things? Do you know God will tell you not to watch certain things? Do you know God will tell you not to say certain things? Do you know God will tell you don't listen to this anymore? Amen. Do you know he will direct you? He'll correct you. He'll give you instruction. Um, if we reject those things, we end up reaping something that we didn't want. And what most believers don't realize, and it's, it could be because of ignorance, it could be uh, not being taught, or it could be because usually it's that. It's not a willful disobedience. But what ends up happening with most believers is when something is going wrong in their life, they have the tendency to do what the children of Israel did in the wilderness. Why, God, why, why, why? And their wine got so strong that it kept them from the promised land. We have to be careful that we don't end up in a position in our hearts where we're going, what, God? You couldn't kill me in Egypt, so you drug me out here? Weren't there any graves back there? Do you realize what kind of unbelief that is coming out of a, of a child of God in that case to the Lord? I mean, you might as well just get, point your finger in the Lord's face and go, what, you couldn't kill us in Egypt? What's wrong with you? How many know that's not good to tempt God? Do you, just, you should not do that. You should just, just, you should practice this. I've practiced this over and over. I don't know that I've done it perfect, but it's established in me. Lord, you're right, I'm wrong. You're right, I'm wrong. You're right, I'm wrong. You're right, I'm wrong. You say, what is that? It's humility and repentance. And out of that, then I'm able to hear clearly so the Lord can correct me, direct me, Amen. I heard a minister say this one time, and I agree with it. He said, if you, won't listen, if you won't let the Lord correct you, he won't direct you. If you're not going to yield to his correction, you're not going to get his direction. It won't happen. Well, I thought we just, this was a religious thing, and we just came to church, and this was a building, you know, and, and we, 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 you know, we ask the preacher for a few things of advice, and then we go home and live our own lives and don't even talk to the Lord. That is not the design of the church. You're supposed to know the Lord like Jesus knew him. Amen. Amen. That's the design of the church is to know the Lord. Hebrews chapter 12. This will be a fun one too. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God's good. Amen? Amen. Hebrews chapter 12. Praise the Lord. Verse number 5. says this, and you, have for, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he... What? You know, I'm convinced there's idol worship in the New Testament too. You say, what do you mean? People will avoid the scriptures they don't like. You know, I don't like that image of God, so I'm not going to chisel that in. <laughs> you know, I heard Bill Johnson say this. He said, he said, don't avoid the scriptures that cut deep. He said, don't just study the scriptures that make you feel like a king. Read all the scripture. Why? It's given for a purpose. It's given for a purpose. This scripture should make you stop and go, Okay, Lord, what are you saying to me here? I should stop and look at the word and go, okay, Dad, where are you correcting me at? Where do I need to make adjustments? Where do I need to add to my faith? Why? Because out of that, you know, his correction is also your protection. If the speed limit says 55 and you're going to go 75 around the corner, come on. You can't get mad at the highway department for flipping your car because they set the sign. They gave you the boundary. And so the same is true in Christianity. If you're going to step outside of love, come on. If you're going to step outside of your love walk, do you know where, you know what's under, you know where, when you... 
this is how I'll put it to you like this. When we obey the word of God, we reap what we sow. So we sow the word and then we reap the word. If the Lord says to us, your faith works by love, Sean, and I step outside of love, it's like standing in the rain, having an umbrella, but holding the umbrella over here. See, if I walk in the love, it protects me from the rain. But if I step outside of it, it's not God in heaven going, I got to teach them a lesson. It's us down here going, man, I should pay attention because it feels wet. I don't know why I'm wet. Don't go, God, why am I wet? Start looking to the word and go, where am I missing it, Lord? I need to find out what the answer is here. Because how many know in the relationship, I've said this over and over, in the relationship, we are the problem with God. He is not the problem. God is the God who changes not. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will never change. So what needs to take place? We in our hearts make adjustments to him and say, God, where do I need to change? Amen? Now you have to do this without yielding to the spirit of condemnation because I know people have been raised in religion and religion has this way of just pounding the, pounding the fire out of you day after day. Okay? So God's not doing that. Conviction always gives you a way out. Condemnation always binds you up. That's how you know what spirit's motivating it, okay? So he says here, he says, I chasten my sons and daughters. I, cha I correct them. Nor be dis And then he says this, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. How many have ever been rebuked by the Lord? Boy, howdy have I. And I didn't crawl up in a ball and, and go, Lord, I guess it's not worth it. No, you... you I, like I think I heard Kenneth Copeland say this one time. He said, step up to the whipping post and take it like a man. <laughs> and then go on with your day, amen? God's not telling you he doesn't love you. He's actually telling you he loves you. How many of you let your kids just do whatever they want all the time? They, you just, they're just allowed to talk to you any way they want. They're allowed to just do and go anywhere they want and do whatever they want. Are you kidding me? Your house is a terror if that's the case. You do realize you're bigger than them. It's intentional, right? It's intentional. You dominate that world because you're the head. You're the lead. But the Lord corrects us because he loves us. Verse 6, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers. How many? Wow. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's funny. You know, I've been a believer for a long The Lord has not corrected me in a long time. <laughs> Are you sure? That just means you're a mess. <laughs> that just means I'm a mess if I've not been corrected. Amen? I need to be corrected. It's good for me to have. I want to grow and be like the Lord and, and represent him well. So he says this. But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. I don't want to be that. I'd rather be disciplined and be a son than be undisciplined and not one. Amen. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful. Is that true? Yeah. When God corrects you, it doesn't mean you got to go, you know, just have a laugh fest. Just, this is the best, Lord. <laughs> you know, it's not joyful. Does the Lord know that it's not joyful? He wrote it in his book. He knows it's not joyful. But you know, God's not insecure. Do you know if you're mad at God, God doesn't sit in heaven and go, Gabriel, they're still mad at me. It's been three years. Where's Jesus? I need a hug. <laughs> that is not the Lord. He is not Jehovah insecure. That's not one of his names. He is God. He stands. There, there is no, he, he made a joke in the Old Testament. He said, I searched for another God, but I couldn't find one. Why? Because he's it. He's the man. Okay? There's, there's no openings for, there's no challenge going on, okay, in the universe. God's got it. He's the winner. 
It's over. So he says this. He says, none of it seems joyful for the present, but painful. How many know correction is painful? Okay. So if this scripture says correction is painful, you can't claim the scripture that says he bore your pain for that. (laughs) Now, this has nothing to do with sickness or disease. Okay. Or anything that would destroy you. How many know there's a healthy pain? Just go weight lift. What's happening? You're tearing muscle, but it's a controlled environment where you're not overextending, and you're, then you're stopping and giving time for that muscle to build back up. It reforms, and what does it do? It gets stronger. So that's the impression that you should be getting out of this, okay? You shouldn't be getting this idea that God's an abuser. God's a corrector, not an abuser, okay? He's not an abuser. He corrects, and sometimes correction can be painful. So he says this, he says, nevertheless, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Notice that it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness and you can claim that promise as long as you're those who are allowed to be trained. If you're not going to be trained by it, you won't yield, you won't have a yield of the peaceable fruit of righteousness. You can't separate the scriptures apart. They all go together, amen? Amen. They all tie together. So you see here that you'll yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And then he says this. He says, uh, uh, verse 12, Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, so that that what is lame, so that what is lame may be may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Sometimes healing is it comes out of correction. Yeah, that's what that said, right? Did I read it wrong? No, I read it right. Healing will come out of correction. You're making adjustments to your life according to what the Lord is leading you to do in in adding certain things to your faith or adding fruit to your life. And out of that correction comes what? Healing. Have you ever met somebody who has weak hands, feeble knees, and is dislocated? It may be because they were not trained by correction. If you're not trained by correction, you can't have a yield of the peaceable fruit of righteousness. It doesn't work. You can't separate the two. They go together. Amen? There's a great scripture where Paul is, uh, I think he's talking to in Timothy or Titus, one of the others, and he's going on and on and on, and he's telling the, uh, the ministers, this is what you need to do, and he's correlating some Old Testament law things to the New Testament, and he's talking through it, and then at the end of it, he goes, meditate on these things. The Lord will tell you what you're supposed to do. In the name of Jesus, meditate on these things. The Lord will tell you what you're supposed to do. Because look, I know some of you are hanging there going, "Uh, what do I have to do then? You need to meditate on these things and the Lord will tell you what to do. Amen? So don't just look for a spiritual breakthrough in the new covenant isn't do's and don'ts, it's relationship. You, 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 have to, you have to engage God. See, we got to be careful with this because there's a balance here. Yes, God gave the gifts, the fivefold ministry gifts, for the purpose of building up the body of Christ. And we do minister and give uh, out of the storehouse of what the Lord has given us to, to be able to help those. But it does not negate personal fellowship. And you can't, you can't try and skirt around waiting on the Lord to get strength. You're just going to have to go ahead and wait. You're just going to have to do it. They're just, well, you say, well, my, you know, this is my family's religion and we were raised in it. That's good. You should have your God, your God. Jesus should be your Lord. It's, it's got to go beyond just, well, you know, we were raised such and such denomination. Big deal. You can be raised such and such denomination and go to hell. Amen or oh me, one or the other. It's true nonetheless. There's only one way to heaven through Jesus. The denominational tag, they can be good. They can be, you know, they're, they're a blessing. But what I'm saying is, is the word of the Lord is the word of the Lord and relationship with the Lord is individual. It includes corporate things. It includes other aspects of the word as far as gifts of the spirit and things like that. But individually, God is going to speak to you about your life. He's not going to speak to me more about your life than you and vice versa unless I just get way off and then he'll send a prophet to me 
and they'll slap me in the back of the head. Stop doing that, go this way. Amen? How many know if it saves your life, you want to be slapped in the back of the head? <laughs> Amen? <laughs> I'm all for it if it saves my life, praise the Lord. If you just want to hit somebody, then, well, that's a different story. All right. Verse 15. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. You know, bitter people are undisciplined usually. Yes. Even, listen to me carefully. Even if the hurt is legitimate, you don't have a right to live in bitterness. Now, and I know there, because people do crazy stuff, okay? How many have ever been hurt before? I, I mean, it starts with your siblings. It starts when you, you, nobody's perfect in this life. Have you noticed? Okay. I, I'm convinced, I'm convinced. I mean, I have, I have two spots, one here and one here, where my brother gave me stitches, my older brother. And when we get together, I don't feel like killing him anymore. <laughs> yeah. Everybody needs a good older brother. You know, because that way you'll have emergency room visits. No, I can't, li I can't go, oh, I, my modeling career is over because of my scars, you know. And it's Toby's fault. He did it, and I'm bitter now, and I, have, I can't do anything. No, I have to get over it and go on, amen? I have to get over it and go on. I never wanted a modeling career, just so you know. <laughs> We're going to clear that up. I can't get bitter. Now, hurt is legitimate. So I don't, want to, I don't want to make it sound like, you know, we don't care. that. The, of course we care. Nobody, we don't want anybody to be in pain like that. But what happens is, and it is the, state, the statement is true, unforgiveness or bitterness is like drinking poison, hoping the other person dies. It just will hurt you. So, and nobody is telling you either that you have to go back and trust that person. Like, I'll never go golfing with my older brother ever again. <laughs> and that stitches was enough. I <laughs> he has not built up trust in that area. <laughs> but you, but I can't, you can't be bitter. Do you understand? You, can't, you need to forgive and let it go. Um, Bill Johnson said this. He said, I'm convinced if we saw how undeserving of forgiveness we were, we would have no problem forgiving others. Oh, man. I thought, my goodness, yes. See, Christ died for us while we were. We don't deserve it. We're worth it, but we don't deserve it. Amen? So a root of bitterness, bitterness has to do with, uh, it's actually, it is acridity or poison is what it is. Bitterness. It's a feeling of deep and bitter anger and ill will, rancor, resentment, and gall. So if there's, um, I heard a minister say this, that he was talking about bitterness or jealousy or, and things like that. And he was flipping through a Christian magazine and he was looking at all these conferences. And instead of getting bitter, what he would do is just see somebody that he knew something about so he'd turn the page real quick so that he wouldn't get bitter. But he said, all I was doing was just being indifferent. See, we can't just look at our brothers and sisters in Christ and just be indifferent. We have to love them with the love of the Lord because we have the love of the Lord. Amen. So what he did is he stopped, went back through the pages, and sat and looked at the conferences with the speakers until he felt God's love for them. And he made this statement. He said his, he said his dad would say this, you, you'll understand how a person's walk if you wash their feet. Because you'll see, oh, that's why they hobble there. Because this foot is a little bit, you see what I'm saying? So bitterness, we have to watch it. You say, what has this got to do with adding to? I'm glad you asked. The last three, godliness, brotherly kindness, love. Godliness, these are the last three virtues that we're to add to. And if we're going to walk in these things, this will stop bitterness in our lives. 
Okay, so godliness. What is godliness? Godliness is defined as reverence and respect or piety toward God. We could say worship, to be devout and to have a God-centered attitude, to worship well. That's what godliness is. It's living a lifestyle that is, an, that is a lifestyle of worship to God. See, oftentimes when we think about worship, what do we think about? We think about slow songs, raising our hands, maybe some tears, you know, stuff like that. That is a form of worship. But what did Paul say in Romans? He said, present your body a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service of what? Worship. Worship is what? It is giving God your whole body. It is making your flesh the slave of God. Actually, I would put it to you like this because I think it fits better with the revelation of the new covenant which Paul received. It's making your body the slave of the resurrection of Christ within you. So then you are no longer in godliness. You are no longer using your mouth, which is really the main thing that we need to control more than anything else. But your mouth, your hands, your feet, your body, your money, your things that you tangibly have, you're no longer using them not for self-pleasure uh, or or, or worship, so to speak, everything you want, but now God is first in everything, so your mouth now becomes God's mouth. Your hands now become God's hands. Your feet now become God's feet. Do you see what I'm saying? We are the body of Christ. And you, everywhere you go, you become an extension of the resurrection. Amen? That's godliness. So he says, he, he talks about uh, this, this particular characteristic of godliness comes right after patience. Why does it come right after patience? While you are patiently, steadfastly waiting in a sustained, joyful manner, you can take time to worship the Lord in the grocery line that isn't moving fast enough for you. At the stoplight, when the person in front of you still is on their phone <laughs> and the light has been green and the Red Sea has split in front of them and you're stuck there and they're doing this. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Glory to God. Father, this is literally a sacrifice of praise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> At that time, I'm going, Lord, turn it into a battering ram. Turn it into a battering ram. <laughs> Oh, praise the Lord. You know, you could sit there and go, well, Lord, at least they're not driving and running into somebody. I think we, we followed a lady down 24th. Well, we didn't follow too close. <laughs> Whew. Every light. Holy smokes, man. You know, people can see you in your car. You should keep that in mind. <laughs> You're not insulated in there, okay? We can see you, okay. <laughs> oh, instead of getting upset about something not changing yet, why don't you take the opportunity to worship? Amen? Secondly, to the godliness, we need to add brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness is Philadelphia. That's what the word is. Brotherly love or love for the brethren. It is fraternal affection fraternal affection brotherly kindness is a virtue that peter must have acquired the hard way for the disciples of our lord often debated and disagreed with one another if we love jesus christ we must also love the brethren we should practice an unfeigned sincere love of the brethren an unfeigned sincere love of the brethren and not just pretend that we love them. Let brotherly love continue, Hebrews 13, 1 says. Be kindly affection to one another with brotherly love, Romans 12, 10. The fact that we love our brothers and sisters in Christ is one evidence that we have been born of God, 1 John 5, 1 through 2. Brotherly love. We're to love one another and we're to do it fervently. Means intently, earnestly. One of the verbs of this word means to be hot or to a boil. Can you imagine the church? You come and you're loved with boiling love, Br brotherly kindness that's boiling. <laughs> you know what I mean? You don't just get your hand shook. You, come on. I love you. 
Brotherly kindness. Come on, if we acted that way, the world would go, hey, I want to join that club. It's tough to be bitter at your brother when you're walking in brotherly kindness. Well, they hurt me. Do something nice for them. But it's not fair. <laughs> Welcome to the planet. I mean, I if you're an adult and you're still saying it's not fair, <laughs> I feel a left foot of fellowship coming on. <laughs> Okay, we got to watch that, guys, because you know as well as I do, that's just flesh. That's just flesh, right? We can't function that. We don't even let our kids function that way. You got to watch that because the nature of your flesh and my flesh, it's all the same. It has those evil desires in there, and they, how many have noticed, they can get stirred up. Just watch the news. Okay. We're to be kindly affectionate. We're to love one another. Finally, we're to walk in love. What is love? That is agape love. The love of God. 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Love suffers long and is kind. Now, I'm gonna kinda, I'm gonna just barrel through these. Suffers means to have long patience or to be long-spirited, to be forbearing. It means, kind means to show oneself mild. Isn't that interesting? To show oneself mild. Love is gentle and consistently kind to all. The Mirror Bible says love is relentlessly patient in bearing the offenses and injuries of others with kindness. The Hayford translation says love suffers long having patience with imperfect people. Love is kind and active in doing good. Next we see in the next verse we see that love does not envy, it does not parade itself, it is not puffed up. The Mirror Bible says love is completely content and strives for nothing. Love has no desire to make others feel inferior and has no need to sing its own praises. Boy, isn't that good? That's really good. You know, if you want to be happy, serve people. Help them get what they want. People say, but then I won't get what I want. Listen, if you sow blessing somebody else, you'll have no problem finding somebody to bless you. It won't, you reap what you sow. The Passion Translation says this, it refuses to be jealous when blessing comes to someone else. Do you rejoice at the blessing of someone else? I heard a minister say this, if you can't rejoice in someone else's victory, then you're, the scripture says in Proverbs, you can, if you're not faithful with that which is another man's, you won't get your own. In other words, he said this, if, you're not, if you can't rejoice in the blessing of someone else, you're proving to the Lord that you can't handle the same blessing. <laughs> Woo, Jesus, correct me, please, I'll take it. See, pride comes before destruction, but humility before what? Honor. What is humility? Humility is deference. It's condescendence. Did you know that? In other words, uh, let me put it to you like this. See, we think of condescending in the negative sense. But if I condescend, if I have a high position, let's say I'm a king and I'm, and I'm among people that are peasants. If, I cond if I'm condescending to them, I will lower myself as the king to raise them up and make them feel equal with me. Come on, does that sound like a savior named Jesus or what? In other words, I'm going to take the empowerment that I have f to better you or raise you up because of godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. And in doing that, I lower myself, but I bring you up. But according to the scripture, the fulfillment of the honor that's due to your life, which was predetermined before you were ever born, will come to pass because you're following the pattern of the spirit of the resurrection. Does that make sense? So you're coming to a place where you're going, Lord, I put me down, but I lift you up. Come on. I lift others up. I lift, I, I serve this person. And when you do that, you cannot miss it because God will put his hand on you and go, look, look, look. I can put into their possession, into their hand, much of what I want to do in the kingdom. Why? Because they're not going to use it for themselves. Come on. Money can be used to protect yourself and dominate over people or it can be used to serve and to build others up and teach them how to make money. Amen? Or it can be, we got to control all this because I want to be a dictator. Love does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. 
There are so many good translations here I could go into. It doesn't think evil. I want to read this to you. Love cannot be provoked. It does not brood over an injury. The word brood means to cover, incubate, hatch, dwell, loom, hover, sulk, pout, stew, or grizzle. Some people, you talk, start talking to them, they have brood over, a, they have a brew. You know how this person hurt me? You want a bite? <laughs> I don't want that stew. Come on. People do this with the church. The church hurt me. How long have you been stirring that pot? 20 years. <laughs> the bitterness is all mixed in. Brother, you need to throw that out and start a new brew. <laughs> Amen? They got food poisoning going on. It gives you a good example, though. Love doesn't brood over those things. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Hallelujah. Love never fails. Would you stand, please? Hallelujah. Love never fails. How many would like to never fail? Walk in love. Walk in love. You know, when you're, when you're uh, discussing something with your spouse and it starts to get a little, you know, how many have felt this before? It gets a little warm. You can tell this conversation's escalating. You can feel the RPM start to rise. <laughs> That's the best time to just, all right, let's just, Let's just give it a little time here. Let's wash each other's feet. Let's see it from each other's perspective. And then we'll come together on this. Amen? You can do that. Add to your faith. If you add to your faith these things, you'll never stumble. Wow, praise God. We're, around here, we're doers of the word. Amen. We do it. Man, if we don't, we repent too. I'm a repenter. I don't know about you. I'm a repenter. I repent. If I did it wrong and I know I did, man, I repent. Lord, that was dumb. He goes, yes, Sean, it was. <laughs> forgive me, Lord. I do forgive you. Let's do it right this time. Okay, let's go. Amen? We have to protect our hearts and keep our consciences clear so that we can fellowship with one another. So don't let the enemy get a hook in you of bitterness toward anybody. You know, if you've experienced something and everybody has in church or whatever the case may be, work with the Lord and do something consistent to where you're either praying for that person that hurts you or maybe, uh, or, or praying for a, a, a church maybe that did something that you didn't like, whatever. Just make sure you keep your heart clean because it affects your faith. Amen? Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you for your word. Lord, you're so faithful to us. You're so good to us. Lord, we will, we will uh, take this word in and we will protect it and we will be doers of your word, not hearers only. Lord, as we look to it, as you speak to us, as you teach us, Lord, as you deal with us in the secret place about the issues that don't need to be public, they just need to be dealt with privately, we thank you that you do. And Lord, as you do, we'll receive correction and direction, and we know that as we receive these things and walk in these things, Father, we know that your word is working on our behalf, and Lord, we are seeing the heavens being opened and your blessing continuing to increase and the advancement of your kingdom. We thank you for your mercy and your kindness. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Thank you for taking the time to listen today. If you would like more information about Faith Family Church, including service times and location, visit faithfamilybillings.com.